chain of events, cause and effect, we analyse what went right and what went wrong, as we discover that many outcomes can be predicted, planned for, and even prevented. I'm John Chigi, and this is Causality. Causality is part of the Engineered Network. To support our shows, including this one, head over to our Patreon page, and for other great shows, visit engineered.network today. Starva Dam On the 19th of July in 1985, the Starva Dam near Tessero in northern Italy failed, resulting in one of Italy's worst disasters, with the resulting mud flow killing hundreds of people, destroying houses, buildings, bridges, and devastating the community in its path. In the 1700s, a variety of different minerals were discovered in and around Mount Prestival, which overlooks the Starva Valley. The primary mineral of interest was Argentiferous galena, from which silver can be extracted. In 1934, a mining operation switched its primary focus to fluorite. Fluorite, more commonly referred to as fluorospar, is a common base material used for extracting fluorine either in its gaseous form or as hydrogen fluoride or hydrofluoric acid, but this requires acid grade concentrations. Lower grade fluorite is also commonly used as what's referred to as a flux to reduce the melting point of both steel and aluminium during their production and this helps to remove impurities. Initially the mine was satisfied with lower grade production however in 1961 the mining company at the time decided to add more refining facilities on site to concentrate the fluorite to acid grade. Previously, lower grade material was carted in full away from the mine site. However, with the purification process, waste material or non-precious dirt, if you like, no longer needed to be removed from site. These materials in the business are referred to as tailings. This required the construction of a tailings dam, which ultimately became known as the lower dam and was built low on the hillside near the mine. Despite a brief pause in activities from 1969 and 1970, as some of the mineral seams were expended and new ones were found, with increased production now possible with the new mineral seams, production increases from 30 tonnes per day to 200 tonnes per day required a second tailings dam to be constructed, which was hence called the upper dam and was situated further up the same slope of the hill as the lower dam was. From 1970 to 1985, both dams were in use, except for a period between 1980 and 82, when the company at the time chose an alternative enriching process. Tailing dams are only required for certain mineral refining processes done at a large scale that have byproducts from the process that can't be used, sold, reprocessed, and are considered waste that can't be shipped or pumped off-site for disposal. Dams are convenient because you can carry particulates by a readily accessible medium, water. Historically, prior to the 20th century, mineral waste byproducts were discharged into our waterways, the ocean, or just poured down a hole or left on the ground. Not all tailings dams are created equally, but they are generally smaller than water dams for drinking water, hydropower generation and storage, which are generally made from formed earth, but the key is that those are usually permanent and their size doesn't usually change. Others can safely have their water pumped off once they're no longer required. Most tailings dams use their waste byproducts to build them higher as needed. As more waste is added, and although liquids can be pumped out or will evaporate, the settling of solid materials to the bottom of the dam ultimately leads to the dam wall raising slowly but constantly. It's often said that tailings dams of this type are self-building. When assessing how high a tailings dam can be allowed to grow in height, Civil engineers need to assess the surrounding terrain suitability, the stability of the base of the tailings dam, particularly how settled the bottom is, as well as what's in the particulate mixture in the dam itself. With that background, we'll now talk about the incident itself. It was a typical summer's day, the day of the incident, a Friday. The first sign of a problem from the dams came from the moment of failure, effectively without warning. At 12.22 and 55 seconds, the upper dam wall failed, sending an ever-increasing flow of tailings water and mud directly into the lower dam beneath it, and within 23 seconds, the lower dam also failed, 
under the additional load from the water from above it. With only trees remaining in its path, nearly 60 million gallons, which is 230,000 cubic metres of mud flow, consisting mostly of tailings plus valley surface erosion en route, reached Stava in 13 seconds. In another 13 seconds from that point, Stava was destroyed. Witnesses reported seeing a fog-like smoke, similar to a forest fire smoke cloud in appearance, approaching them at a very high speed, accompanied by a deep rumbling, similar to an earthquake. At 12.29 and 48 seconds, shortly after the initial dam failure, the mud flow reached the two Tessero bridges and destroyed them shortly thereafter. At 12.31pm, exactly, the mud flow reached Alvisio Valley and within 20 seconds the flow came to a rest and settled. It had travelled a distance of 2.6 miles, 4.2 kilometres, at an average speed of 22 miles per hour, which is 35.3 kilometres per hour, and was over in approximately three and a half minutes. In the immediate aftermath, 281 people were reported missing. Of those, ultimately only 13 were found alive, leaving 268 people in total, consisting of 89 men, 120 women, and 59 children were killed. 56 residential houses, 6 industrial buildings and 8 bridges were destroyed in the incident. 9 additional buildings were severely damaged and ultimately needed to be demolished. So what went wrong? The difficulty investigating this incident stemmed from a complete lack of information. Most of the investigation's findings were pieced together using seismogram records and core samples of the final settled flow at multiple points along the path of the flow. Initial suspicions that an earthquake had triggered the dam failure were quickly proven incorrect by comparing seismographic readings covering the immediate and then wider area and clearly showed that it was a highly localised incident and not an earthquake. Additionally, it was thought that underground vibrations from nearby unrelated mining activities, rock wall blasting specifically, had triggered the incident. The investigators decided to test that by measuring three independent rock wall blasts from three different mine locations to see if seismograph readings resulting from these tests in any way showed similarities with those that were recorded during the incident itself. They did not. In fact, the explosions barely registered at all on seismographs in the area. The investigators began looking into the dam's construction. About six months prior to the incident, a leak in the upper dam sidewall created a 65 metre or 210 foot long gap in the upper dam wall that remained leaking for three months until it was finally repaired. A few months later, the company drained both dams to perform proper repairs and then returned them to service again on the 15th of July 1985. The summer months have the highest rainfall in the valley, and this particular year the valley had 22% more rainfall than an average year. In addition, the snowfall from the previous winter was exceptionally good, which had led to consequently a larger than usual spring melt. Ultimately though, the design and maintenance of the dams needed further examination. The upper and lower dams were both earthwalled dams. They both faced the valley, with the upper dam abutted against a slope, with a moderate to heavy forestation. The walls were made from medium to fine grade sand and thin, though uniformly layered, clay silt. Building the walls employed a process of centrifugal separation using what's referred to as a hydrocyclone. The technique is most analogous to the way a bagless vacuum cleaner works. The combined waste water enters the top of a large funnel and using a mixer or alternatively directed pumped jets of water and guide contours forces the water to spin in a circular motion as it goes through the cyclone being pulled down by gravity. Heavier particles will then accumulate on the outside of the funnel and as they clump together they become too heavy to remain in suspension in the water and hence fall through a hole at the bottom. Meanwhile the water and only lighter, finer silts exit slightly higher up the funnel. The upstream method was used for the Stava Tailings Dam, which in itself isn't unusual, as approximately half of the world's tailing dams use this design. Building in this fashion begins with a starter dike at the base layer that is actually pervious, 
which is to say it permits seepage through it as a method of pressure reduction. The tailings are deposited on the top of this dike at what's called the dam crest, where they slowly build a beach backwards, starting from the dam wall, filling in towards what is usually, and was in this case, a natural slope or incline at the far side of the dam. The finer particles are sometimes referred to by civil engineers as the slime when they mix with the water, and this is deposited closer to the centre of the dam, well away from the wall. The idea is that the coarse sands build up in behind the dikes with water filling back towards the natural land surface and the fines making up the majority of the centre of the dam. This creates what's referred to as a spigoted beach or a tailings beach as this embankment shell at the time was not particularly compacted to aid in settling. However, this has become more common in recent times to improve the resilience of the dam wall. Compacting is usually done by driving large heavy industrial equipment over the top nearest the wall. The idea is that if the water is extracted from the centre of the dam, then free water in the centre of the dam will have a clear beach from the dam wall with a large area of exposed sands that do not get directly wet from the tailings deposits. By extracting the bulk of the water from and controlling the water level in the centre of the dam continuously, it allows a process called consolidation, whereby the coarser sands compact naturally while still retaining some capacity for drainage. If water isn't extracted consistently, then the consolidation won't happen, and between the sands and the slime, they simply will not settle. The higher the dam is built, if there isn't sufficient consolidation and settling, then the foundations will not be stable enough to handle the additional mass of tailings it now needs to support as it grows in height. If the water content increases too much, then liquefaction can occur, at which point the material no longer supports that above it, and collapse is almost certain. Liquefaction is the effect where a solid under specific conditions begins to act like a fluid, and in the case of small particles, if we push water into those particles, they separate and move with the liquid, but if we pull the water out of them, they clump together and bind and create a more solid structure. So what was the problem with this specific dam? Well, specifically, it was found that a drainage pipe that had ruptured a month before the disaster had ceased to control the level in the dam, and whilst the pipe was repaired during maintenance some five or six days prior to the disaster, it is clear that the repair itself was either ineffective or subsequently failed upon the return of the dam to service. The most recent raising of the dam required the felling of a significant number of trees on the natural slope forming part of the extended dam wall, and the trucks hauled the felled trees across the embankment, which, for such a steep embankment, and given the instability present, was not an advisable course. Additionally, the changed landscape on the hillside without trees changed the water runoff flow path, and heavy rain specifically, two days before the incident, are thought to have contributed to the failure as well. The ongoing lack of stability in the upper dam substructure because the water level had not been carefully maintained, along with additional water ingress due to rainfall and spring melts, vibration from recent truck movements and the most recent dam rising, meant that liquefaction was inevitable. It was only a matter of time. The investigation did, however, note several key points. There was no instrumentation or periodic testing to determine the stability of the slime, the consolidation of the sands, or any other kind of health measurement for the stability of the dam. The continued raising of the dam was based on a flawed assumption that the base materials had consolidated. However, no attempt was made to assess if this was actually true, either due to lack of expertise, overconfidence, or for cost reduction purposes. There were no inspections by independent third parties. During the trial, it was revealed that in 1974, the municipality of Tessero requested the Mine Bureau of the Autonomous Province of Trento ensure that the safety assessment of the dam was carried out. The Bureau entrusted the operating company of the time, Fluoromine, to assess their own dam, which they did in 1975. Even at that time, some 10 years before the incident, the technician that performed these checks went on the record stating the bank of the upper basin was exceptional. That is to say, it was built on the limit of civil engineering stability, stating it's hard to believe 
that they are still standing with reference to both tailings dams. Now, that was in 1975. However, the official response to the Bureau at the time was positive and lacked any specific details of this concern. The overall construction of the dam led to the upper dam being 34 metres or 112 feet high, with the natural slope of 14 degrees inclination and the final outer dike wall inclination of 40 degrees. The structure was significantly taller and narrower, with much less supporting base than is recommended for an upstream design. The compensation for damages due to the accident was 132 million euros. There were several trials and appeals. The first ended on the 8th of July 1988, and subsequent appeals trials finally ended on the 22nd of June 1992, which confirmed the convictions pronounced at the original trial. The Law Court of Trento summarised as follows, and I quote the English translated verdict. The settlement system, as a whole, constituted a continuous threat looming over the valley. The system collapsed because it was designed, built and managed in such a way as not to provide the security margins that society expects of constructions liable to threaten the existence of entire communities. The upper bank was bound to collapse as a result of the slightest alteration to its precarious balance. End quote. Compensation was paid by companies that had been involved with the construction and management of the upper dam specifically, as well as local government. This included civil engineering managers on behalf of employees acting under their direction. The mining company at the time, Proyalpi Mineraria, declared bankruptcy. As a result, they paid no compensation at all. Of those convicted due to appeals in the Italian legal system structure, none have served their full prison sentences. Since the incident, and several others around the world during the period during... Since the incident and several others around the world during the 1980s, stricter inspection requirements for tailing stamps have been introduced in most parts of the world. So what lessons do we learn from this? The real lessons here for engineers are a bit harder to track. The key points are more cautions. A large body of water held back by any means should always be a cause for some concern. There's a lot of potential energy there. Planning where you put a dam relative to where people live in the event the mine post-dates the settlement, the course is clear, don't build one there. If the mine predates the township, then local government failed in allowing people to build in a danger area in the first place. That was not the case here, but still worthy of note. There are other mitigating measures like diversion channels and such, but they're very expensive. And the truth is that in many cases, there may be no safe place to build a dam like this at least not economically, and that needs to be factored into the business case from the start. If you're a civil engineer and you're inspecting dams like this, as a technician was in the mid-70s, make sure your concerns are heard, because people's lives are at stake. Ultimately, though, we should all share some measure of concern, specifically about tailings dams, Estimates in the early 2000s found that globally there were approximately 3,500 tailing dams in the whole world. And due to its lowest cost approach, the upstream construction method has been used for half of those. So there were 1,750 high-risk tailing dams in the world, and that was 20 years ago. With mineral extraction and refinement increasing around the world and competitive pressures pushing the lowest as reasonably possible or a LARP approach to mining, that number now is undoubtedly much higher. And if it was me, I'd never build or buy a home anywhere near a tailings dam or any other dam for that matter. All it took in this case was a broken water pipe, a few years of company neglect, and it all came crashing down. 268 men, women and children paid for that with their lives. If you're enjoying Causality and want to support the show, you can, like some of our backers, Chris Stone, Ivan, and Carsten Hansen. They, and many others, are patrons of the show via Patreon, and you can find it at patreon.com slash johngigi, or one word. Patron rewards include a named thank you on the website, a named thank you at the end of episodes, access to pages of raw show notes, as well as ad-free, higher-quality releases of every episode. 
There's a back catalogue of ad-free episodes available and a new Making an Episode tier as well. So if you'd like to contribute something, anything at all, there's lots of great rewards. And beyond that, it's all very much appreciated. Causality is part of the Engineered Network and you can find it at engineered.network and you can follow me on Mastodon at chigi at engineered.space or for our shows on Twitter at engineered underscore net. This was Causality. I'm John Chigi. Thanks for listening.